My name is Brad Scott and I'm a fourth generation dairy farmer here at Scott Brothers Dairy and in with a partnership with my older brother Bruce and my father Stan. We're located in Southern California in a town called San Jacinto which is about an hour and a half east of Los Angeles. Uh, we're milking about 1100 uh, Holsteins twice a day. Uh, here on the, our operation we also do farm. We have about 700 acres of irrigated farmland and what we produce here on the dairy then we also have a creamery that the family owns in Chino which is about an hour west where our milk is shipped and products are made such as everything from fluid milk to culture products sour cream and frozen yogurts tell me a little bit about uh, the history of the dairy when was it built and uh, how it's evolved uh, since its inception well being a fourth generation uh, family farm uh, we're kind of excited that this year is actually our 100th anniversary uh, my great grandfather came out from waterloo iowa in 1913 uh, settled in Pomona, California. He came out in a rail car with a couple Guernsey cows, a few chickens, and started in 1913, and we're at 2013 here, celebrating our 100th year in business. Since you started it in this location here, tell me about how the dairy is changed or evolved. Uh... It is kind of interesting to see how things have evolved and changed throughout the dairy industry. You know, not only just in the machinery use, but also the fact of environmental issues, uh, sustainability practices, even though you know the dairy industry has always been very sustainable, uh, we've had opportunity to actually uh, you know demonstrate some new different ones. One of the areas is uh, about six years ago we put solar panels in, so about one third of the dairy's needs on electricity is currently coming from solar panels. You know, when you talk about sustainability in the dairy industry. Um, it just kind of goes to show there's been a lot of practices that have been done for many years, but we continue to do that. You know, also goes into our current project of what we're working on as far as a gasifier. Uh, you know, it's kind of exciting to be one of the first dairies in the country to actually take cow fertilizer and make biodiesel out of it. So things have really changed and evolved in the dairy industry. The Scott Brothers' new project to install a manure gasifier not only makes them more sustainable, it also solved a new regulatory requirement that nearly shut down their operation. Brad's brother Bruce Scott explains how. We were hit upside the head literally with a regulatory mandate about 10 years ago that said that we could no longer put manure or processed uh, dairy waste water on our crops for agronomic uptake. All of those are involved. So my argument was to the regional board, now if I have a soil that's depleted by 2,000 pounds, and I have actual soil samples here that show that my soils are out of balance by uh, needing about 2,000 pounds per acre of uh, calcium. I said if I apply that calcium to the ground to make it um, productive and uh, healthy, am I loading 2,000 pounds of uh, TDS to the ground? Mm -hmm. And their answer is yes, you'd have to mitigate that mm -hmm. because it might leach to groundwater. Our dairy permits run five-year cycles, so our permit was renewed in 07 with the understanding that the industry would address the problem. The problem was we didn't know what the problem was. It had never been identified. It wasn't quantified, and uh, mitigation measures have never been studied for TDS. In most other watersheds, you're dealing with nitrogen or phosphorus impairments, and those are uniquely identifiable. But TDS includes all minerals in the mineral chart and all the minerals that are involved in a crop's uptake. So we set out first to identify the, and you'd think this would be normal knowledge, but nobody knew exactly how many cows or uh, animal livestock units were in the valley. We didn't know where the manure was uh, being applied because nobody was keeping records of it. Some were exporting it out of the region, some were uh, sending it to farmers, uh, that uh, crop farmers that were taking it for their own benefit. Others like ourselves that are the dairy and the farm, we were using it as part of our whole holistic operation. And they were telling us that we could no longer apply manure or uh, water from the wash barn or anything else to the ground. So we had to somehow package that and ship it to somebody else's backyard. Uh, that was their answer. Uh, I don't believe that responsible uh, sustainability involves shipping your problem to somebody else's backyard. That was one of the reasons we got in the problem here is uh, the Regional Water Quality Control Board had banned the manure application in another region near us 
and they were shipping all of their manure to our backyard and applying it for years. And when we told them that uh, it was being applied in, uh, in excess or at abusive levels, they told us they didn't have the manpower to enforce it. So they're always their sol a regulatory uh, individual solution is, is it's too problematic to control it, so we'll just ban it. So in 07, we actually went to the regional board and says we are pending funding from the uh, State Water Quality Control Board for um, uh, agriculture assessment of nutrient loadings, and this is what our plan is. So we went with them, actually a full work plan, and presented it and says this is what we would like to be able to do, but if we're not going to be able to stay in business in the region, obviously we cannot accomplish this. So they liked the fact that we had a plan and direction, but uh, we had no uh, real, other than just uh, my promise that uh, I would not let the subject drop. Uh, they agreed to let us move forward and it said in there that we'd, we would be doing these deliverables and come to an expectation that, that would meet their, uh, uh, or come to a result that would meet their expectations. Our permit then expired in September of 2012 and was to be renewed. We had uh, far met their expectations. We had uh, had work done here on the property that was done by the federal EPA on uh, nutrient uh, management and uh, leaching mitigation and is actually a published paper on the federal EPA website or as for regarding nutrient migration. We had done the integrated regional dairy management plan in its completion and had that as a deliverable. We had several other deliverables that were accomplished and we were getting pats on the back from the federal EPA, the state regional water quality control board and our local water quality control board as well as our local environmental groups were giving us uh, that a voice for our accomplishments. We got in a situation though in September 2012 where we went in and we've got all these accomplishments but they basically told us this is wonderful you've studied the problem wonderfully but you haven't implemented anything. I knew this was going to be the point of contention because in the permit it says we were to be fully mitigated or uh, cease loading. Bruce turned to engineer Steve McCorkle and his company Agway Solutions to learn more about gasification and its potential to address their unique situation. So I met Steve for the first time in, uh, in early uh, 2010 and our project had just wrapped up in December of uh, 2009. And in there, in all, as we studied the world, literally, for all of available technologies, we had discovered and I had met with and talked with some other uh, people regarding gasification of uh, manure waste. The problem was none of them could bring me a technology that would meet South Coast Air Quality's stringent air quality emissions mandates. So even though I thought it was the best technology to solve the problem in other regions, I did not and we did not include it as the highest ranking priority at the time for our own problem because nobody was known to have had a permit to operate. It wasn't until a couple months later that I discovered that Steve was working in Chino and had a permitted under South Coast Air Quality uh, pilot project doing exactly what we thought should be done but never thought could be done. That was the game changer when he had a operating permit for his technology in his hand and was operating a pilot project, that was what changed the game. I was intrigued with the severity of the punitive measures of their situation. I mean, basically 26 dairies in this RAC Act group were going to lose their operating permit if they couldn't solve this mandate of zero TDS discharge. I mean, that's, that's the most severe uh, punitive measure I had ever even heard of in the animal waste industry. Then, uh, as I got to know the farm and the dairy operation itself, I was extremely impressed with the sustainable practices that they had already put into place. So it was the right kind of environment for a project like this. 
So explain uh, the step-by-step -step process of the system that uh, has, has been installed here at uh, Scott Brothers. Uh, you know, what, what, what are the inputs and then what are the outputs? Okay, well the first step in the process is to separate the liquid manure uh, solids from the liquids. And in doing that, we trap the uh, solids we trap the smallest particles actually in the solids. We've removed 98% of the total suspended solids over five microns in size. And in doing that, we can reduce the phosphorus in the water, in the discharge water, by about 90%, uh, the TKN nitrogen by about 67% or two thirds, and the salts by about 40%. And uh, we produce a water that is clear in color, mostly nutrient-free, but it's a good water for irrigation in terms of its inorganic to organic nitrogen ratios and the uptakes of most of the crops that are grown on animal farms. So it's a good irrigation water as it is. Uh, the second stage of the process and what we'll be doing here is to take that water to a zero TDS discharge type of water or potable water actually because that that is what potable water is. And uh, so we'll be taking that discharge from the, we call it the solids recovery module, the first stage of the process, into a water treatment module to produce this zero TDS discharge water for this particular farm. That won't be done on all farms, obviously. The solids from that device are mixed with the dry corral solids from this farm, or, and in most farms. Uh, to produce the combined feedstock to the gasifier. And that's a fairly high BTU feedstock. It's uh, in a combined stage like that, it'll be somewhere around 8,000 BTU per pound, which is a good quality feedstock for gasification. Then we feed that into the gasifier. Uh, it thermally decomposes those solids in the absence of air. This is a pyrolysis type of gasification technique. And it produces a high energy biosyn gas as its primary product of almost the heating quality of uh, natural gas. And then as its secondary products, it produces a char or an ash type of discharge, which is a very good fertilizer because that's where most of the potassium and the uh, phosphorus ends up is in this concentrated ash fertilizer which is only about 10 percent of the incoming volume of the manure so here with this one ton per hour uh, gasifier that we have one ton out will basically produce you know 200 pounds or less of ash discharge a secondary byproduct of the gasification is a water that is uh, fairly high in ammonia. That's where most of the ammonia-based nitrogen ends up, is in the water discharge. And that's also a good fertilizer um, for, for certain crops. The gas from the gasifier is cleaned. It has to be removed of contaminants, particularly H2S, hydrogen sulfide. Uh, before it is fed into the liquefaction device or the Fischer Trope module. So it's a synthetic diesel and it's actually the uh, cleanest burning diesel available on planet Earth. And it's much cleaner obviously than petroleum based diesels. It doesn't have sulfur in it at all so that dramatically reduces the particulate matter emissions. And it's, it's quite a bit cleaner burning even than biodiesel. Part of the hopeful and near-term success you hope to enjoy uh, came from basically kind of vetting it all, and putting everything out there, leaving no stone unturned, yeah. uh, looking for any available option. Yeah. Without that, would it have been possible to do what uh, you're doing here? I don't think so. Uh, and everybody says, why are you helping save your neighbors? And why are you helping to save the industry? Um, above yourself and uh, that's not something you usually see in an industry but uh, number one we farm here and we dairy here 
So if we had the additional expense of transporting all of our manure to somebody else's backyard, at the same time we were having to buy commercial fertilizer to fill the gap created by the fertilizer, we no longer had a sustainable operation here. As everybody knows, the profit margins in the dairy business and in farming are not high enough to uh, absorb those new costs. So I looked at this and says, this isn't a new cost. This is actually a profit center for a dairy that uh, is in an industry that's got to learn to get more vertically integrated and not count on just a milk tank check. One of the questions I have for you, you mentioned the uh, likening this process of evaluating technologies to you know, entertaining uh, vacuum salesmen. How did you know um, that uh, the technology you settled on, uh, AWS, wasn't just some visiting uh, vacuum salesman? The difference is, is everybody else that came to us wanted to sell us something and wanted to solve my problem or our problem before they even knew what the problem was. Steve was the first one who I went to him and asked if they were interested. And honestly, at first, they weren't because they weren't looking for a California business model. They were looking to do stuff out of state because of the complexity here. And it was actually me that convinced him to tackle it in the toughest place first and everything else would be easy. So uh, he didn't come to me like a vacuum cleaning or salesman making claims that were uh, unjustified. I did the research, the background, as you heard from, uh, and had other people do it, and it vetted out very well. So that gave me a higher degree of confidence. But the ultimate one is, is most other people either want to sell it to you and leave and you have no support, or they want to take your material and give you nothing for it, and they are going to make the money. And that doesn't sit well with a dairyman or a dairy community and that will be one of the downfalls to most of the other competitors. Steve's business model is to have the dairyman have skin in the game and own part of the process and actually reap the rewards monetarily of the process. Dairymen do not necessarily need a way to get rid of their waste. They also need a second revenue stream to make the dairy industry sustainable in these new times. Tell me what uh most excites you about all of the work that's been done here? Well, it's a first of a kind. I mean, this will be the first dairy in the country, maybe perhaps the world, to convert its dairy manure into renewable diesel, clean water, potable water, and fertilizer on the farm. So these things have been done, you know, in components or off the farm but this will be the first time all of these things have ever actually been produced on a working dairy farm. Mm. That's what's exciting. Mm. 